like this has caught whatever was wrong with the projector yesterday, so that will seem to go out now. So we might have to focus on this. Right, where were we up to? Um, basically, I sort of led you through the crystallographic terms because I need to be able to describe the crystal. So if I want to describe a macroscopic crystal, there's actually a small part of it, a C part of it, that I could use to describe the whole thing. I don't need to describe every atom because it's just a repeating pattern the same way as a part of a wallpaper <coughs> is a repeating pattern. So that if you want the repeating pattern that we repeat in the X, Y, and Z, or the A, B, and C direction, is an unit cell of dimension A, B. So we define the unit cell and we talked about the different shapes we could have of the unit cell and I mentioned that the different shapes would allow you to have contained within those cells different symmetries. I haven't really discussed that, and that's what I'm going to do today. Because the smallest real part of the crystal is really the asymmetric unit. And the symmetry of the unit cell will be applied to that asymmetric unit to fill the unit cell, and then the unit cell will be repeated to give the full crystal. So I'm going to start today by talking about that unit cell symmetry, if you want. You've done point groups last year. Today I'm going to be talking about space groups. Now, the position of the atoms or anything you put in the unit cell is defined in terms of fractional coordinates, that is, relative to the side of the unit cell. And if you think that you could describe a, a molecule in terms of x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, z2, and so on, well, the symmetry, the easiest way I had come to think about the symmetry was that it will then reproduce that molecule in position minus x, minus y, minus z, in this particular example. So this particular unit cell has got an inversion point relative to the way I've described it there. So it's, the atom goes in at x, y, z, and it will then produce a partner at minus x, minus y, minus z. Now, different unit cells, different symmetries, have different numbers of these operations. But what it means is that the asymmetric unit is then generated a number of times depending on the symmetry of the space group. A good way to think about this actually is in terms of if you think about a pattern. Um, I don't know if any of you made uh, patterns using potatoes. You, you, you carve out a little segment and then you print, make a potato print. So you could say, I want to make, I can't afford wallpaper and I'm going to make a design. There's my design there. And you say, well, that's my unit cell. If there's my unit cell there, I'm going to, I'm going to make a potato print out of that and go stamp, stamp, stamp to cover the whole wall. So, so it's okay, I understand what an unit cell is. But you, you, might, say, you might be lazy, I'm lazy, that's the first quality you need to be a crystallographer. <laughs> and you might say, well actually I can't be bothered to carve all that out. What I'll do is, I'll carve <coughs> that amount out. Now, if you carve that amount out, you can then go stamp, 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 stamp. So, your carving takes a lot less time. So, that's the asymmetric unit, that part there. That's the unit cell, which is then repeated by translation. So, what we're talking about now is the symmetry operations that will generate each of these segments from there. So, in this case, the operation would be just a fourfold rotation, which would be defined in terms of x. Y and Z in there. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. I found it after doing point groups a big relief to be talking about real things. Okay? In, in, in point groups, you're sort of looking at a molecule almost aesthetically and saying, ah, oh, that's got a mirror, that's got a, a rotation axis. Whereas in this, it's very, very concrete. You put an atom in at X, Y, Z, and the others will then, by symmetry, be generated in the other positions. So, in addition to having these X, Y, Zs associated with each symmetry operation, they will also have symbols. You'll be familiar with some symbols from last year, so I'll tell, give you the symbols we use in crystallography. They're different symbols, but they mean the same thing. Right. Don't worry, I'm not going to do C2s and things for you, just in case. You might remember in the distant past, I think the symbols we use in crystallography are sim simpler, but they mean the same thing. So, for example, last year, if you wanted to say a rotation axis, you would say C n. Okay, so C two would be a two-fold rotation axis. C three would be a three-fold rotation axis. 
In crystallography, in our system, we just say two, three, and four. So if, if you saw the symbol two, it would mean a diode, a two-fold rotation. If you saw the symbol three, it would be a three-fold. So, so C2 and two mean exactly the same thing. But that's what we use in this. In um, point groups, remember last year, you were, for a mirror plane, you used the symbol sigma. Um, we are a little bit more straightforward. We use M for mirror. Okay, so when you see an M, it means a mirror, which is logical. In proper rotations were S2, S3, S4. You might remember they were a rotation and a reflection combined. In crystallography, we've got this combined operation. It's actually a rotation and an inversion. Sorry, because it amounts to the same thing. It would be putting a bar on top of the number. So uh, uh, a rotation, um, an S, S3 rotation would be a bar 3 rotation. It means the same thing. There are some new operations which I'm going to go into during the rest of, of, of quite a big part of this lecture now, which you haven't seen before. And the reason for that is that your operations last year, they were called points which were good reason, at least one point stayed put. Okay, so they were okay for a molecule, because a molecule stayed put. Now we're talking about something that's going to repeat thousands and millions of times to give us the micros macroscopic crystal. So we're allowed, as part of these operations, to translate in a special sort of way. So there will be symbols that you'll see today. Two with subscript one. That's a complete symbol, okay? We can't separate the one, little subscript one from the two, okay? It means a two one, which is a screw axis, uh, and, and so on to the three ones and the four ones. So those all mean a new type of rotation, which involves the translation as well. I'll explain it in a second by using two one as an example. And also you'll see symbols a, B, and C, lowercase now, not the large ones where we use to describe the, the, the centering of crystal, whether it's primitive, body-centered F, and so on. These are lowercase ones, which you'll, you'll see will occupy a position at the end of the space room. And what they mean is, they're related to M, the mirror, but there is also a translation in this. Okay, and, and that's all right. If you're defining a pattern, you're allowed to have operations which repeat as the pattern does. You will also notice that we never have <coughs> five-fold and seven-fold rotations in, in, point, in space groups, which you can have in point groups, it's not a problem. The reason for that is that whatever pattern we have has to tessellate. I, it's, it, we, we, we're actually tiling the, the whole crystal. We have to repeat. So if you've got a five-fold rotation or a seven-fold rotation, that won't work. You won't tessellate. You can't have tiles of that shape. You can have rectangular tiles. You can have diamond shaped tiles, you can have triangular tiles, you can have hexagonal tiles, but you can't have tiles which have got five-fold axes and so on. They won't fit on a flat plane. Space groups, these operations are combined together in the same way as they would be combined in a point group. Again, I find it very, very useful to think in terms of X, Y's and Z's because I can visualize an atom being put in a general position X, Y, Z, and then being put in the three other positions in this space group. So this particular space group has got the symbol PMM2. It's an orthorhombic space group. P stands for primitive. M stands for a mirror perpendicular to the, well, um, along X, if you want. The second M stands for a mirror along Y, and two is a two-fold rotation around the Z axis. So, so the, the notation is there, slightly different to your previous notation, but very, very plain. Okay, two, two mirrors and a two-fold rotation. You might actually recognize this from last year. What gave you two mirrors and a, a rotation was C2V. So, so this symbol here is the same as C2V from last year. But we've also got those operations there going with it, i.e. The, the, the atomic positions, the fractional coordination. Uh, positions of the atoms. I'd just like to make a quick little point here at the end of here about what I think is quite, quite useful when you're looking at crystals and so on and these operations. If you um, think about mirrors for, uh, for a second, we actually just reverse one of the x, y's and z's. So mirror it along x would be minus x, y, z. A mirror, mirror, mirror along y would be x minus y, z. So there's just one of the x, y, and z that have been reversed for a mirror. 
For a two-fold rotation, two of the operations will be reversed. So you've got a minus x and a minus y, and as, as it's a round z, the z stays the same. And the race that goes with this, so if you've negated one, you've negated two. An inversion is actually when you've negated all three. So if you've got something that's got a minus x, a minus y, and a minus z, that represents an inversion. So very, very straightforward. If we now look at our crystal shapes, triclinic was the most general shape we had. But because it doesn't have any angles of 90 degrees, we can't have rotation axes in there. So we can either we can only have two space groups which have got a triclinic shape. We can either have the first space group, which is primitive, one fold, which means that we don't do any rotations or anything. It's a it's a 360 degree rotation if you want, and that would only have one operation in it. So if you put something in as x y z, that's all that goes in that cell. So that's the most simple space group you can get. You just repeat an item in the A, B, and C direction. The second space group, which is the only other one in the triclinic system, is an X, Y, Z with an inversion. It's all right to invert the general triclinic cell. It won't reverse any of the points uh, that make an obtuse angle go to uh, an acute one or anything. It'll still look the same shape, but the only operation that will do that will be an inversion minus x minus y minus x. And that's the end of triclinic. There are no more triclinic space groups. <coughs> if we go to the monoclinic system, and you might remember that all that does is A, B, and C don't have to be the same, but we've got to have two angles some 90 degrees now. So effectively, it would look like a thick tile if you want to. We did have angles on two angles on 90 degrees. So that's what does that do? It allows us to have more symmetry operations. Again, we could still have the um, inversion. That's all right. But now we can have C centering and so on. So we can have centered cells. That's worth having in a monoclinic system. We can have two-fold axes, no more than two-fold in a triclinic. And we can have mirror planes as well. So this bumps up the number of space group from 2 up to a total about 14. What you'll also notice when you look at the triclinics is that we have other operations which you're, you haven't really met yet. And these are operations which involve translation as well. Now, I'm going to focus quite a bit at this point on P2 1 of the C. And the reason for that is it's the most common space group. Uh, I had a colleague who hated symmetry in all its forms. He used to get me to do his symmetry tutorials and everything. He hated it so much. And, but he used to, so when he used to come into the x-ray lab, he used to like um, having a quick look at the screen and say, ah, yes, P21 over C. It was a little bit of a gambler, but about 60% of the structures are P21 over C. Area, so he had a good chance, but it made him look quite good as well. Okay, so P21 over C is a very good, so if you can understand P21 over C, it's got a lot of useful things in it, and also it's one of the space groups you'll meet most often. <coughs> right, it's got a C-glide plane in it. <coughs> what does that mean? Well, let's look at the, the mirror part first, okay? So we've got the operation here, x minus y, half plus z. Forget the half for a second. The x minus y, z, that's a mirror part of it. But it doesn't end at that, the operation doesn't finish at the x minus y, z. It's also got a translation. It's down z, it's down c, hence the c line. Okay, I've got a, a picture on the next slide I'll show you. So this involves a reflection and a translation down c. The second type of new operation I want to show you is a two-fold screw axis, denoted by the two separate one, and it's also commonly called two one. And what this means is, again, you've got your rotation, the minus x and the minus z. There isn't a negation of the y. But if it was just a straight rotation, it would be minus x, y, z. And there's, again, this translation of half down y. Um, I could probably draw a little bit more out of this at the moment, actually. Um, if you remember when you used to apply rotations, for example, in um, point groups, if you repeated the rotation, you would eventually get back to the same place. If you thought about it, something going around like this, you could go 180, 
360. And it, so you keep coming back like the hands are on the face of the clock to the original place if you keep applying. So in this case, let's apply the operation again. So there's the first application here, x minus y, half plus z. Let's apply the same thing again. The x is still the x. There isn't a sign or anything in front of it. Now we're going to go minus y and minus y again. Multiply the signs together so we end up with y. Okay, so when we apply the mirror a second time, we come back to where we were before. And the simple way of doing that is just multiplying the signs together. So applying it a second time, we go to x, y. What about the half plus z? Well, like another half. So when we've applied it a second time, we've got x, y, 1 plus z. So we're not actually going round and round in circles now. What we're doing is actually we're going to the next unit cell, a complete 1 operation. So that would translate by 1 down C. And that's fine. It's, imagine a crystal as a giant apartment. All the rooms are exactly the same. So what you've done is you've just gone from this room to exactly the same place in the next room. You wouldn't even know you've gone to different, they were all the same. And that's fine. So that type of operation where there's a translation to exactly the same place in the next cell is perfectly all right in space groups. That's why they're called space groups. So that takes you to the next cell, just one along in C. And if you look what happens in the twofold true axis, if we apply the minus x again, we come to plus x. If we apply the half plus y again, we come to 1 plus y. And if we apply the minus z again, it goes, goes to z. So we've gone to x, 1 plus y, z. So by applying that operation again, we've just gone up 1 to the next cell. And that's perfectly fine. So uh, I picture it. So let's, let's have a look at the operation, and maybe I can explain a bit better. There's my pictures. <laughs> Okay, I picture, let's start with the two-fold screw. There's the two-fold rotation where they just go around the pole. In the screw axis, I picture there's somebody going up a spiral staircase. And there's one full turner of the spiral staircase to go up to the next room above. So the little man here would go around, and he's halfway up the spiral staircase. If he then completes the operation by doing it again, he'll end up in this position, but by one unit cell along. And that's perfectly fine. So that's a two-fold axis. It seems to, compared to pine groups, to do something you wouldn't expect to happen. But in fact, for crystals where we want to repeat, repeat, repeat by A, B, and C in each direction, by translating it a full B or a C along there, it's actually B I've got there, it would actually be fine in a crystal. You can translate by a full B, and that's fine. So the, the halfway house would be uh, a B over two of here and then it's applied again. So that's perfectly fine. That's a two-fold screw axis, a two-one, two-substrate one. And the, the first operation I gave you was a mirror combined with a translation. So if we apply the mirror, obviously it's just going to go, in, the, in this example here, it um, goes from x, y, z to x minus y, z. If we now turn that into a C glide, the operation will go, again, x, minus y z, but he would actually then add a half z to it. So that would be x minus y half plus z. If we then apply it again, the man would come back to this side and he would move on to there, which is just one c along and that's fine. So we've got these new, new operations now, a two-fold um, screw axis. It's the, um, there are three folds and four folds, but if you can understand this, it would be great. And then there's a C glide I've given you as an example here. There's B glides, A glides, and there's even diagonal glides, but all the same principle. P2 over C is by far the most common space group. And there's the operations. I've combined them. There's X, Y, Z. There's my minus X, um, half plus Y minus Z. That's my two full screw axis. And there's X minus Y half, that's my um, um, C glide. Now the thing you might remember from last year, when you have groups, you can never go outside the group. So if you apply an operation of a group and then apply a second one, the, what you'll end up with is another operation of the group. You, you won't go outside, that's why they're called groups. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to apply that operation, the minus x, half plus y minus z, and then I'm going to apply the second one, which is your C glide, x minus y, half percent. One after the other. 
And the way you do that is to multiply the signs together and add the translations. So minus x, x goes to minus x. Half plus y minus y goes to half minus y. Okay, the minus y goes in front of that and put a half. The minus z and the half minus z goes to half, the, the minus z and the z goes to minus z because the sign is plus one and minus one. And the translation is half minus z. So that's not one of the operations we've got here. Okay, it's a new operation. And it's a minus x, minus y, minus z. It's an inversion. Okay, it's not an inversion at zero, minus x, minus y, minus z. But all the same, it is an inversion. It just happens to have been translated a little bit. Okay, so the, the point of inversion is at actually not a quarter, a quarter. So that's the point of inversion. But by having the three negative signs, it's an inversion point. So the space group P2 on of a C, very, very like your, if you remember your point groups from last year, the whole number of operations isn't contained in the name. You've got to look up in the point group table for all those operations. In this case as well, we specify the 2, 1, and we specify the C, but in fact there is another operation, and which is an inversion. So the, the four operations, if you want, in the P21 over C space group are X, Y, Z, which is your, if you want, identity in your terminology from last year. You've got minus X half plus Y minus Z, which is your two-fold screw. You've got X, one, negative minus Y half plus Z, which is your C glide. And then finally, to make the full set, you've got this inversion operation, minus X half minus Y half minus up. And then you now we can multiply those operations and go round and round in circles and you'll never go outside that set. You might go one cell along or in one direction or the other, but you will never break out of that space room. It's completely self-contained now. Yeah. We've only got two, the, that sounds quite a lot, doesn't it? But the, the fascinating thing to me is that every single crystal structure we know, every crystal structure we will ever know, every single crystal structure in the whole universe that anybody will ever know will have to belong to one of these 230 space groups. Okay, that, that's, if you want, the pattern for every single crystal that will ever be known. They can never, never be a, another 231. So, so if you want to get your Nobel Prize, don't bother. There isn't going to be a 231 anyway. Okay, so they're completely contained in this. So how do we, as a crystallographer, how do I work? Well, you might think from, from last year, we just pick up molecules and try and assign symmetry to them. We don't. The symmetry is something we get actually before we know any molecules at all. Here, the first thing we find out about a crystal when we put it on the diffractometer is its unit cell, the A, B, and C, alpha, beta, gamma. So that's the first thing we get. The next thing we get is actually the symmetry, whether it's P21 over C or PMMM. Okay, we, we, we can find the symmetry of the system right at the start. We don't even need to know what molecules it contains. And the way we can do this, you've already encountered that thing possibly we're going to encounter it again at the end of my course <coughs> is there are systematic absences so reflections will be missing so for example primitive will have no conditions body centered also given the symbol i will have this condition h plus k plus l must be even for it to be present in other words h plus k plus l must not be even for it to be absent. And as we've given the name systematic absences to these events, um, we, we usually end up with equals and there's a line through it. But what we're really saying is the only reflections you're gonna get are the ones with H plus K plus L even. Okay, so, so if we looked at a set of reflections from a crystal, we don't need to know anything other than um, the indices of the reflections, the Miller indices of the reflections we would be instantly know whether it was body-centered just by looking to see if the only reflection present had H plus K is L even. So we would know that part straight away. Likewise, 
if we wanted to know if, if it was phase centered, we would look for this condition. Now the base condition is that H plus K, H, H plus L, and K plus L must all be even for it to be present. Okay, but that distills down to H, K, and L must all be even or must all be on. If you found that condition, you would know that the system was F centered. How do you know if it's P2 or over C? There are other conditions as well. And one of them is H0L. If you look at the class of reflections where K is always zero, you will find that if it was P2 or over C, that the only reflections present would be the ones where L is even. So that would tell you straight away that you had a C glide. If you then looked at the zero K0 zero reflections, that's down the B axis, and found that they were only present when the K was even, it would instantly tell you you had a two-one line. And this goes right through the, the, uh, the, the space route. You would look for these signs, and you would know right at the very start of your analysis which symmetry you have. Okay, so the, the symmetry is part and parcel of the determination from the start, and it's part and parcel of the reporting of the structure at the end. And when you're starting, you will probably look at the systematic absences in the international tables, the one with the 230 space groups. But very quickly, you will know what the ones are for things like um, uh, P21 over C, because you keep seeing them all the time, and also they're already built into the computer software we use. How would we decide whether we have P1 or P1 bar? Because neither have got any systematic absences, it aren't glides or anything like that in them. If you look at the intensity of the reflections and, and look at the variation, are they, uh, do they tend to have extremely high, extremely weak ones? That will tell you whether you've got an inversion center. The ones with inversion centers tend to have extremely high ones and extremely weak ones, more than ones which haven't got an inversion center. So we know that. So all you've got to do is do a statistical analysis. When I say do, the computer will do a statistical analysis and it will tell you whether you've got P1 or P1 bar or, or any other space group which has got an inversion center. So using that statistical analysis, and the conditions eight and nine above there, you would know right at the outset what space trip you had, and you would then use that as part and parcel of the rest of the analysis. So what I'd like to do next is to look at practicality. So, so this is just what we do upstairs in the X-ray lab, and what the machines do up in the X-ray lab. So we know I've given you all the terminology I'm going to use in crystallography. Now I am going to give you or discuss some equations with you after I've done this in the next lecture. But for now, I'm going to you know all the vocabulary and the concepts I need you to know. So I'm now going to just tell you about how we actually go about meshing. So determining a single crystal structure. The most important step is drawing a crystal. If you don't have a crystal, you can't do any of these other wonderful things. Okay, so the number one step is drawing a crystal. Um, I particularly like this technique. You, you will all know how to draw crystals. You will all have crashed some crystals out sometimes, but um, sometimes you will do, do it by evaporation. You might even um, do it by cooling. So those are sort of standard methods of drawing crystals. Particularly if you've only got a small amount of material, it gets a little bit tricky then. So this technique is particularly useful. And effectively, it's a relation of when you crash something out with an anti, what we call an anti -stop, something the material doesn't dissolve in. So you dissolve the, the material in something which is highly soluble in, and then you could then get a second solvent, which you tip it in, which is effectively a non-solvent if you want. And everything crashes out and you end up with a, a precipitate. But of course, we want a bit higher quality crystal than that. So, so this technique allows you to do the crashing out in a very, very gentle way. You put the material you want to crystallize out in a solvent is soluble in. That's the red solution <coughs> in my picture there. And around that, in a larger container, you put 
what we call the anti-solvent. You don't tip it in, you're very, very careful <coughs> not to do that. But what happens then? The vapor in here fills with your anti-solvent. If you pick the right combination, of course, if you pick the wrong combination, the solvent that the red, the red solvent there will leave and go the other way. So you must pick the right combination. So if you pick the right combination, what will happen is the, the inside of the container will fill with vapors of the anti-solvent will gradually work their way into the inner container. And over a few hours, you'll find that that level will rise, and then you'll end up with nice twinkly crystals around the inside of the container. And that's fine, and that'll be great, because that then will then open the door to do the rest of the work. So if you can grow a crystal, you can then go into the next step. Uh, I should possibly at this point explain that what I mean by a crystal. Um, you, you probably wouldn't be able to see the crystal with your naked eye. The, uh, the, the normal crystals we use are no bigger than a quarter of a millimeter. The reason for that is the X-ray beam is no bigger than a quarter of a millimeter, smaller than the laser pointer on here. The intensity of the X-ray beams is far higher than it used to be when I started, so we really don't need a crystal even a quarter of a millimeter. That would be the, if you want, the ideal size. Very, very often these days we're dealing with crystals maybe which are 0.03 of a millimeter by 0.03 by 0.06 or something like that. That's not uncommon. Okay, so when I say crystals, don't expect to be able to see the crystals in the container. If you can see them, that's not the problem. You can always cut them down. But don't think, oh, I must be able to grow something like this because the, the, the instruments are so um, sensitive and have such a high intensity X-ray beam these days, we can deal with something very, very small indeed. So, but the most important step is you must have a crystal of some sort. I've given you the standard crystal size there, a quarter by a quarter, a quarter of a minute, which is very small. You'd, you'd be pushed to see that, actually. But that's the size of the beam, so it doesn't need to be any bigger than that. You'd have to cut it down if it was bigger than that. But really, we could work with a lot less than that. The thing about selecting a crystal, remember we're a chemistry department, and a lot of the materials we're working with will be sensitive. And by that I mean um, they, they will either decompose under the action of oxygen or moisture, or they might even lose part of uh, the components which will lead to the crystal deteriorating. So what's changed a lot since I started is actually something very, very simple indeed. We immerse the crystals these days in an inert oil. And that protects the crystals from the atmosphere and stops the crystals losing their salt. So that is actually made a huge, huge difference to how we can work. So what it means is that we can get a crystal, we can protect them in a glove box, we can actually even protect them under an inert atmosphere. But at some point we must be able to inspect them and pick the crystal using a polarizing microscope. So we insert, immerse them in this oil and that will give us the minutes we need to select the crystal. So very, very important. If we then view them under a polarizing microscope, that's a fantastic instrument for seeing faults and cracks. Okay, so the important thing about this technique is we must have a crystal, but it must be as perfect as possible. If it's too crystal, it won't work. If it's a crack crystal, it won't work. Okay, so we must have as perfect a crystal as we can get. And that means if we look at it using a polarizing microscope under cross polarizers, and that will highlight any blemishes in the crystal. Once we've stopped our crystal, we can then fish it out and keeping it covered in the oil. Okay, so where does the crystal end up? Well, that's my attempt at drawing the goniometer to head. But basically, the crystal is that tiny little blob on the end of the fiber there. We use a glass fiber. So, so where, where would that crystal have come? It would have been under the microscope in this oil. I would have then got my goniometer head, which is this part I've drawn here. This, that's the real thing there. It's a little bit smoother than as I've drawn. Okay, so, so the little fiber would be used to fish out a crystal, and then it would be screwed into the diffractometer there. Um, the the goniometer head has got screws on it, so I can adjust, so I could screw that way, this way, that way, so to get the crystal centered on the diffractometer. Now, coming down from there, there's the nozzle. On that blowing, gaseous nitrogen, okay, so completely dry, towards where the crystal is sitting in the fiber. That will instantly freeze the oil. It's an oil, so it doesn't diffract, okay, it doesn't have any regular order. So if you want, it's a bit like a toffee apple. So your crystal is picked up 
on the fibre, sitting on the end of your fibre, we screw it into the diffotometer and instantly it's coated by a dry, in, uh, in, in a coating of oil and then sitting in a stream of dry nitrogen. So even the most sensitive materials will survive that. Okay, they're cooled down. The temperature is 100K, minus 173. There are other reasons for cooling it down, but one of them is to protect the crystal and encase it in this solid. Um, well, it'll act like an adhesive as well and keep the crystal rigid on the end of the fiber. The x-rays come out of that fine polymer there, so it will come out as a very, very fine bead, probably as fine as my laser pointer here. And then most of the x-rays then would get caught in that thing that's hanging down there. That's called a beam stop. And the reason for the beam stop is that if we didn't have it, the x-rays would strike the detector with their full force and, get, and, and bleach out the middle of the detector. So most of the x-rays go straight into that beam stop there. So the crystal now is sitting. Once you've adjusted it, right in the path of the x-rays there, you adjust it with a video camera, which is part of the instrument. Where is it? I put it down as a telescope there. It's actually a video telescope. So I've got it, the image of the crystal on a little TV screen. And then I can adjust the position of the crystals using these little screws here, which will then put the crystal right in the center of the instrument, where the x-rays travel across there. And then with the, any scattered x-rays, any diffracted x-rays, will then be picked up on a screen here, which is a relative of your digital camera. So once we've closed the x-ray proof doors, we can then turn the x-rays on, and we can record an image. Like, okay, so it's, it's very similar to the one I showed you before with my film, which was recorded many, many years ago. We've got this bit hanging down here is the beam stop to stop the x-rays damaging the detector, which is quite expensive. It's about the best part of £100,000. And then we've got then these spots. And the, it's actually a negative version of the one I showed you. We can pick to have it any way you want. It's a CCD image. The big difference is that was recorded in probably 20 seconds. And then it can rotate the crystal a little bit more and record another one. I rotate the crystal a little more, I record another one. So you can do all this automatically. Whereas before, once I'd exposed my film, I'd then go to the dark room and develop that, and then put some more film in, and so on. So it's speeded things up by a factor of about 100 or whatever, during my photographic skills. Okay, so, so why do we want to go to all this trouble with a crystal? By sticking it on in their fiber, and then putting it in the middle of a diffractometer. The diffractometer, by the way, is a robot. Here's a schematic representation here. And what it's designed to do is to rotate the crystal at all kinds of angles. And the best way to think about that is, imagine a crystal plane. Just pick one. Okay, so it would be, I'd have a mirror in my hand. And I want to, I've got a light, an intense light, or it could be the sun, I suppose. And I want to shine it in your eyes over there. So I need to have uh, the ability to manipulate this crystal, to move it around, so I can bring this crystal plane into a reflecting position, to a diffracting position. So this instrument costs <coughs> about 150 to 200,000 pounds. It's designed to do that very, very precisely, because it tips the crystal to all kinds of angles. So that's why it's quite as complicated as it is. As detectors get bigger and bigger and bigger, we will need less movement here, but we will always have to move the crystal somewhat in order to bring the different the planes into a diffracting position. We can't get away with that. So there will always be some movement, but the degree of movement will get less. So the instrument we've got at the moment is known as a four-circle diffractometer. It's got a detector, two feet of motion. It's got an omega to move the whole instrument around. It's got a circle, or a circular motion in that direction. In our case, it's a kappa motion. And then there's a tiny little motor that drives the crystal around, and it's a fine. We, in addition to that, we can also move the detector in and out in our instrument or under the control of the diffractometer. Um, it's a robot, so once we've, we've gone through the various steps, the instrument can then be left alone overnight or over the weekend. Okay? So it isn't an instrument you've got to keep an eye on. It will, it will do all the measurements needed automatically. Okay, so I've said that, I think, so I don't need to repeat that, but the crystal is cooled down. You can read that afterwards. We, we cool the crystal to protect it.
Okay. Once we've got those reflections on the screen, we've got a, a, a program which harvests the position, the reflections. Okay, so the reflections are harvested off the screen, and what that gives us is the angle of diffraction of each of those reflections on the screen. Because the instrument, remember, it derives the motors very, very precisely. It knows exactly the position to a tiny fraction of a degree of all the angles of the crystal. If you then take that with the position of the CCD screen, it can then combine those to give, if you want, the angle the reflection was leaving. Okay, so as soon as the thing is reflected, it goes onto the screen and say, that was at, I don't know, 30 degrees to the horizontal and north by northwest or whatever. Okay, so it's got all the angles for the diffraction. So all those are stored on the screen. If you've got those angles, there's an algorithm that will give you the unit cell, easy piecing. Okay, so you don't have to, I, I will give you how to get a cubic unit cell out of a powder. We'll do that later on. But for this instrument and a single crystal, there's an algorithm, provided it's a single crystal, will give you A, B, C, alpha, beta, gamma, just like that. How long does it take? Five minutes. Okay, so if you get a crystal on the diffractometer, five minutes later, you will have on the screen the unit cell. You can compare that with known unit cells if you wish, um, uh, and to check whether it's a known structure. But really, we're talking a very short time. The, the algorithm that works out the unit cell from the angles of the reflection is very, very efficient. Once you've got the unit cell, you're in a position, I say you, the computer's in a position then to decide what constitutes a full set of reflections. What, what do I mean by that? Well, I've already mentioned that different unit cells have different degrees of symmetry. And that would actually be reflected in the diffraction pattern. If you had something that was triclinic, you would look at it and you wouldn't see any um, symmetry at all in it. However, if you had something which was hexagonal, you would see in the pattern a six-fold axis. Okay, there would be a neat six-fold axis in the pattern. They would, so instead of looking like the stars at night or disordered, you would find it would repeat like the face of a clock every 60 degrees. So what does this mean? Well, there's no point in measuring all the reflections because you're going to repeat them. Okay, so, so once you've got the unit cell, you know the crystal class. You're in a position then, or the diffractometer is in a position then to decide you only need to measure one-sixth of a reflection you would need to measure for tritonic or one half. Whatever. So, so the instrument decides based on the unit cell what it needs to measure then in terms of a full set of reflections. So the lower the symmetry of the system, the more, more reflections you need to measure. The, the higher the symmetry of the system, the less reflections in uh, proportion of the reflections you need to measure. Right. The final thing you will do on the diffractometer, or you must do on the diffractometer, is then to collect, correct the reflections. So the corrected intensity <coughs> is given this term here. HKL means that's of a, a particular Miller index plane. And the F squared is, an F is known as a structure factor, so the F squared is known as a corrected X-ray intensity. And before it's corrected, it, uh, it would just be an IHKL, as I've drawn it there. But there are a few corrections you do. One could be because the material decomposes. We had to do this in the older days, in particular, but the crystal is so well protected now, there's very little decomposition of the crystals. You would also correct for absorption, which I'll say a little bit more about now, and also what's known as the Lorenz and polarization correction. Now, these are all functions of the instrument. I don't have to do these corrections. The instrument does them. Uh, I'll, I'll show you how in a second, but, but the Lorentz and polarization are just purely a function of the construction of the instrument. The decomposition would be, you would repeatedly measure similar reflections over and over, and you would see whether the crystal was actually deteriorating. And the absorption is to do with the shape of the crystal and the type of atoms that can absorb in the crystal. And again, that can be done on the instrument. 
Okay, so this is just giving you the terms, which I've just given you. I, I is the raw intensity before it has corrections, and then F is known as the structure factor, <coughs> and obviously the, the modular. Um, well, I, I won't go into that at the moment, because I'm going to go into that more later on. Decomposition is just a decomposition correction, which is very, very straightforward to do, but it's negligible. Maybe the absorption correction is a little bit more interesting, because it can be a real pain. If you've got a crystal which absorbs really, really strongly, you'll find, well, probably this is the best way to illustrate it, actually. If, I, if you imagine me now with my little mirror, reflecting it in your eye, I can actually rotate the mirror, keeping it parallel to its rotation, and it will still blind you, okay? So, so I'm, what I, that sort of reflection is known as a, a side reflection. I'm just keeping the mirror parallel, but I, I'm allowed to rotate the crystal. I'm not putting it out of the diffracting position, because I'm keeping it parallel all the time. Okay, so if I, if I just rotated it, kept it parallel, okay, so, so it wouldn't leave the diffracting position. But if it was a needle-shaped crystal, what you would find is that in this direction, the crystal would be thinner. But if I went into that position, it would be effectively be a thicker crystal. Now, if absorption was negligible, and it did that, you'd find a particular reflection would stay exactly the same, doesn't matter what position I took. However, if absorption was significant, what you'd find is as you rotated it and you got it into this position, you'd find there's a dip in the intensity. And as you rotated it over there, you'd find it would climb to a maximum. Now, if you're in that position, what you find is, especially if you're working with heavy atoms, as a lot, that is the ones with lots of electrons, such as the lanthanides, for example, you would find, you would get a lot of noise around the heavy atoms, and it would actually spoil the, um, the, the final structure. Not, not, not destroy it, but just make it of a poorer quality than it should be. So something you can do on the instrument before you finish it is to do this type of correction. You've got the crystal on the instrument. And with the way we used to do it was just exactly as I, I said now. You rotate the crystal around and find out where the dip is, and then find out where the maximum would be as you rotate it. We don't need to do that now because every single reflection we measure will be measured multiple times. Remember, we're measuring with an area detector. So with the best with the, of, in the world, you're not going to be so efficient that you're only going to measure each reflection once. So you will measure each reflection multiple times, five, six, <coughs> seven times. And by analyzing the variation of intensity of the same reflection measured at different angles, you will effectively get a psi absorption surface and apply that. So the crystal, the data will be corrected more or less automatically for absorption. The other one, which is applied automatically at the end of a data collection is Lorentz and polarization. The polarization is because in order to get monochromatic for x-rays, we actually bounce them off the surface of a graphite crystal, which acts like a diffraction grating. So we've already bounced them off one surface, and everybody knows, anybody who's had any Polaroid glasses will tell you that if you look at the surface of water with Polaroid glasses, you can see into the water, whereas if you don't wear them, there's glare. And the reason for that is, if you bounce something off a surface, you will partially polarize it. So that what happens here. So we, can't, we bounce the crystals initially off the surface of a graphite to monochromate them, and then they partially polarize, and then they will be then bounced off the crystal. And in the same way as polarized glasses, if you rotate them around, will give you maximum and minimum intensities. These will do the same thing. You don't really want to have that error in your data, but it's a purely a function of the instrument design and the circle positions. So that can be calculated very, very easily as part of this correction procedure. And the last one, the Lorentz, polarized, Lorentz correction, is basically to do with how long a, a reflection is in position. Some reflections will stay in position for a long time as the crystals rotate in, especially if they're parallel to the beam like that. Others, for the same rotation, will just twinkle in and out. Okay, so again, the, the, all this is known to the software that's controlling the diffractometer, and that correction will be applied. I've never, never in my life applied the Lorenz polarized correction personally. Okay, it's all done by the software that controls the diffractometer. But they're, they're completely predictable, and they will then give you higher quality reflections.
Finally, you apply the space group by looking at the systematic absences. The data collection is finished, and so we are we for today. Thank you very much.